have you read Free to Learn? That's what I hear most when first connecting with people who also love working with kids or have an interest in non traditional education. Free to Learn, authored by today's guest, Dr. Peter Gray, is perhaps the most popular gateway to this new world of parenting and educating. His work unites the sometimes conflicting factions of this movement, making him an icon we can all rally behind. Everybody loves Peter Gray. Before becoming Dr. Gray, Peter studied at Columbia University and then went on to earn a PhD in biological sciences at Rockefeller University in 1972. In that same year, he joined the psychology department at Boston College and has served as department chair, director of the undergraduate program, and director of the graduate program. He is now a research professor and author of the widely adopted university textbook, Psychology, first published in 1991 and now in its eighth edition. Dr. Gray has conducted and published research in mammalian motivational mechanisms, neuroendocrinology, developmental, evolutionary, and educational psychology, anthropology, and children's natural ways of learning and the lifelong value of play, particularly age-mixed play. In 2016, he helped to found and served as president of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, and in 2017, he helped found Let Grow, which you already know all about from our last episode with Lenore Skenazy. We highly encourage you to check out the book, Free to Learn, Why Unleashing the Instinct to Play Will Make Our Children Happier, More Self-Reliant, and Better Students for Life. And check out his very popular blog for Psychology Today magazine called Freedom to Learn, in which you'll find articles like Play as the Foundation for Hunter-Gatherer Social Existence, The Decline of Play and Rise of Psychopathology, the survey findings of grown unschoolers' experiences with higher education and employment, and the evolutionary functions of play. It's incredible stuff, and now here to tell you about it, along with our host, Shannon Falkenstein and Dr. Peter Gray. Good afternoon, Dr. Peter Gray, and welcome to the New Schools Podcast. Thank you so much for being on with us this afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. Excellent. So we, um, so you have had such a, um, a varied career that spans many disciplines, including psychology, anthropology, education, sociology. Um, would you, to, and, but, but, so much of your focus, at least recently, that I know of is focusing on children, the freedom to learn, unschooling, differently schooled modalities, play. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your origin story and your career? How did you come to be ultimately so interested and inspired by children and their development? Sure. Um, so uh, I think if I think about it, there are there are a number of different um, routes to this um, interest that has been quite a passionate interest of mine for many years now. Um, I have to say that initially, as a first as a graduate student and then as a, an assistant professor at Boston College, um, I was more of a biologist studying uh, brain um, hormone interactions um, in laboratory animals. Um, I was interested in that research. I was publishing articles, getting grants and so on, but I, uh, I can't say that I was passionate about it. I never felt like, you know, there's some people who do this kind of research who feel like somehow their discoveries are going to help the world. And I never really felt that way about the research I, about that research. I found it interesting, but and I think there was something about my growing up and how my parents were and, um, that I've always felt like I wanted to do things that would help make the world better. And um, so that's one route to this. Um, another thing I have to say in terms of going back farther in my life, I, um, 
I was a child in the 1950s, which um, was a very different time in the United States than it is today in terms of children's lives. This was a time, you know, when I was five years old, I could go out and play anytime uh, the school wasn't in session or wasn't dark. And actually, I, any school wasn't in session for me at five. School started at six then for me. But the uh, and and other kids too. It wasn't you know. And so kids, there were a lot of kids. Kids were out playing all the time, and we also moved a lot from town to town and in every community I learned how to get along with the kids in that community by learning what they played and in all of these places children played away from adults adults weren't involved in children's play we, did, we didn't have there was little league actually going all the way back little league baseball but that was a kind of a minor thing if we played it at all we played baseball pick up games of baseball we you know so so that was normal childhood when i was growing up i since have learned that this was normal childhood pretty much everywhere as still is someplace as it was pretty much normal childhood throughout human history that children play away from adults so i have that memory that experience and <clears throat> Even when my own son in the 1970s and 80s um, was a kid, um, play was very common. Kids went out and played. <laughs> um, at yeah, some that point, was certainly my experience too. Just we yeah. were out until it got dark or we heard our mom yelling us for dinner and then we would come yeah. into dinner. And um, at some point I realized that this isn't happening anymore. And um, so that that uh, has certainly been part of my own experience has played a role. Another thing that played a role is, um, and I think the turning point in terms of my actual research was the fact that my son, who I've just mentioned, um, really rebelled in public school. He went to school to a, what was supposed to be a very fine suburban school uh, from kindergarten through uh, fourth grade, fighting it all the way. And um, he would he would tell us it's prison. He hated to go there. He uh, he felt um, belittled there. He felt like this was um, he felt like he wasn't being treated as a, a, with respect as a human being. And he kind of even articulated it that way, uh, as a, even as a little kid. And and I kept trying. You know, we didn't have much sense. My, his mother and I wouldn't have much sense about what all there might be. So we just tried to get him to do what the school wanted him to do. Uh, I, I remember many times I'd say to him, you know, just do what they want to do. <laughs> you know, you're just making trouble for yourself by rebelling. By he, he would do everything in a different way than the way the teacher asked him to do. And then the teacher would get mad at him. And then the teacher would invite his mother and me in for some kind of a conference <laughs> as if it's somehow our fault. And maybe it was, I don't know. But the... Uh, <clears throat> But at any rate, finally, uh, we realized that he was not going to, uh, f he was not going to give up this fight. Uh, school was not working for him. He was absolutely not going to follow the rules. It was getting harder and harder to even make him go there. And sometimes he would just leave in the middle of the day and come home. And so um, at some point, we finally realized that we needed to find an alternative for him. And so we found this radically alternative school called the Sudbury Valley School. This was um, back around 19, late 1970s, around 1980. And um, the school had been already in existence since 1968. It's now still going strong. So it's um, about 52 years old at this point. Uh, and this is a school that's as different from what we usually think of as schools you can imagine. Um, there, it's a it's a building. Uh, it's a day school, so kids go home. Uh, it runs pretty much by the same school same school schedule as the public schools. But uh, and there are kids there from age four on through um, on through what we would think of as high school age someplace else. But they're not thought of as high school students or elementary students, or they're not divided by grades. They're just there, age four through late teens. Um, and um, they're free to do whatever they want, as long as they don't uh, violate the rules of the school and all the rules are made by democratic procedure at the school meeting. Uh, one vote, uh, one person, one vote, regardless of age. And none of the rules have anything to do with learning. The rules have to do with the kind of rules that any 
like reasonable size community needs to have just so people don't interfere with one another that um, and so people keep the keep the place decent no littering you can't break things you can't hurt somebody else and so on and so on reasonable rules like that so those are the that's the way the school runs uh, there are lots of opportunities for people to do things uh, but nobody is uh, required to do any of them you could sit there all day twiddling your thumbs if you wanted um, and nobody would tell you not to um, the staff members there don't call themselves teachers. They don't think they do any more teaching than anybody else. And I think they're correct on that. So that's the, uh, that's the school. And of course, uh, I, um, as a typical parent, was concerned uh, as to whether uh, what the long-term effects of this would be. Um, I was happy that my son was happy. That he said, this is exactly what a school should be. and the twinkle came back to his eyes, the, he became his cheerful self and his uh, he, uh, very, mo yeah, very clear that uh, he had many interests and he was able to pursue those interests and so on. And so his development seemed fine, but I was a little bit concerned about whether um, he would be able to get a job or go on to, suppose he wanted to go on to higher education. I, I don't think I'm the kind of parent who would push a kid into college, but if I, I would want him to have that option if he decided he wanted some kind of a career that required that. So I ended up um, doing a study of the graduates of the school because I couldn't find anybody else to do it. And I and it was not a disinterested study. I, I wanted to know if the graduates weren't doing well in the world, I wanted to know that because I, then I would do everything I could to try to get him into some kind of a more normal school. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> but the result of that study was <clears throat> my finding that the graduates were doing very well in the world. Uh, so, um, so that relieved me as a parent. I didn't have to worry about it anymore. But it also intrigued me as a scholar. Isn't this fascinating? Here are these, here are these people who've grown up not doing what we think as a society the kids have to do in order to do well as adults in the world. They're not doing school. They're not just plain not doing school as we think of as school. What are they doing? You know, if you look, they're playing. They're just doing what you would think kids would do when they're free. They're, they're, not, they're not suddenly because they're free studying math books. <laughs> you know, they're not because they're free, you know, in some systematic way studying geography or history or or arithmetic or, or uh, you know, and there's no reading classes, but yet everybody seems to learn how to read at some point or another. Um, and so the question became, well, how are they learning? How are they, how do they acquire whatever it is that allows them to do well in adulthood at this school? And so that led to the questions that I've been pursuing ever since, such as how do children learn through play? How do children, and also even really, what does it take to do well in this world? Does, does, does school have it completely wrong about what it takes, you know, their typical school? I'm sure now that it does, you know, that uh, um, what does it really take and how do you develop the, whatever it takes to do well in this world? So those were the questions that arose. So that was the immediate effect. There were many other things that led into this, um, this interest. And, and, uh, including the obser my observation that um, that whether or not kids are going to school, um, well, especially for kids in school, there's much less opportunity to play and explore outside of school. So school is taking over more and more of children's lives. And, um, and even when children are not in school or doing schoolwork at home, they're often in school-like activities after school in the United States. All this got shut down with the coronavirus, but before the coronavirus, kids were kept biz so busy at, that they really didn't have time to pursue hobbies or develop their own interests or play. They're just kind of doing stuff that adults are managing. And so a few years ago, I got interested in that phenomenon that, you know, between the time when I was a child in the 1950s and now, there's been this continuous decline in children's play. And that's not just based on my memory. Other people have written about this. And there's even a, some research and historians have described this decline of play. It really began in the late 1950s and continued on to today that um, 
that with every 10 years, kids have less time to play than they did the previous 10 years. Every generation since then grew up with less play. So you grew up with less play than I did, but um, kids today are growing up with less play than, you, than your generation had. And, and so then I began to look, well, what are the consequences? What, you know, we would think there'd be consequences of this. Play is pretty important to children's lives. Play is what makes kids happy. I mean, right, you take away play and it's gonna be a pretty depressing life. So then I looked into the research and other people indeed had done research that documents the fact um, that rates of anxiety and depression and even of suicide have dramatically increased over this same period. So as play has declined, the opportunities to play and pursue their own interests have declined. Anxiety, depression, suicide, other form, other evidence of mental disorder have, have increased. Should be no surprise to anybody that that's true. But, uh, it, but I documented that and wrote, uh, wrote uh, an academic article about it, gave a TED talk about it, gave TEDx talk about it, talk and, and have, um, have been pursuing that line of work for some time. So ultimately, you know, these experiences led to sort of two very closely related lines of my research and also my advocacy work, which is one, to um, let people know that actually you don't have to go to school, or at least in the United States, it's not, you know, there are legal ways of avoiding school and, um, and uh, there are ways of doing what I now call self-directed education. And uh, that the evidence is that it works well, uh, at least if you can set up the conditions that allow it to work well. I don't think you can just turn a kid out on the street and expect that the kid is going to be educated. But if you provide the appropriate conditions, you what you what you find is you don't need to you don't need to do any coercive teaching. You don't need to have a curriculum. You don't need to do any testing, as long as you have a healthy kind of environment in which children can learn, in which their their educative instincts, as I call them, um, are allowed to operate. Because this is an environment in which they can operate, children will educate themselves. And so that's one line of work, research. And then the other line of research is in advocacy is uh, for kids who are in school. So for some time, there's still going to be a lot of kids in school. What can we do to allow more play and um, self-directed activity both in school and out of school when they're, when they're not in school? Okay. Wow. That, that I love your journey. It sounds like your son was like the call to adventure to go deep into this path of learning about education and how children can learn on their own. Um, I want to just back up when you first started talking about play, you said that there are still some places in the world where free play exists, where, and I know many of our learner, many of our audience might want to move there. <laughs> Where would you say it's still possible to do that? Well, well, there, there, are some, uh, there are some differences among European countries. So for example, in Germany, there's more opportunity than there is in the United States or Australia or in uh, the UK. Um, there are, but there are, but interestingly, third world countries have more, what so-called third world countries have more opportunities for play typically. I met a woman a few years ago who, um, of course this was some time ago that she had come and maybe things have changed, but this was a woman who was a native of Kenya and she had, uh, she came to the United States at age 16. And she said, the first thing that struck her is that all the children and the dogs were leashed here. <laughs> and in Kenya, they were free. And she noticed that all the children and the dogs were unhappy here. <laughs> in Kenya, they were happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so, and I've, heard, and I've heard that from other places. I also have to say that um, in one of the, I, I, an event that kind of tr triggered my initial realization about how much things have changed before I began to look at the research on that, was um, about the year 2000 or so, maybe a year or two later than that. This was a, a few years after my first wife had died and I remarried and um, my new wife had two children. And so I suddenly acquired these two relatively young stepchildren. And um, 
and we, as a kind of bonding experience, we went to the Dominican Republic and we were on this resort, but we decided to go off the resort and see what the, the real Dominican Republic was like. We went into the city and I saw all these kids playing, <laughs> you know, playing, playing in the street, playing, you know, playing in vacant lots, playing no adults around. And I thought, and I said to my new stepchildren, you know, this is how I used to play. <laughs> we used to, kids always used to play this way in the United States. And, and it, it was that, you know, it jarred me into thinking, oh, that looks so familiar that, and, and then it realized they don't see that anymore in the United States. And so that experience too played a role in, in, in this. So, you know, I don't know if that's still true in the Dominican Republic, but generally speaking, I think in less developed areas, there are more children are less uh, constrained than they are in more developed areas. I think that also that varies also by socioeconomic status. Like I'm sitting in El Salvador, yeah. I live in El Salvador, and um, you definitely do see many children playing outside, but children that are kind of of that like first world yeah. socioeconomic class it's exactly like the u.s everything is scheduled everything is yeah. organized there's always an adult intervening and controlling and um yeah. it truly is tragic um yeah i agree I, and i think this is spreading unfortunately you know we set the pattern and it spreads and it starts maybe upper class and it seeps down to affect everybody um mm -hmm. I used to be able to say that uh, that uh, working class people and even people in some poverty that the kids had more freedom to play in the United States than uh, wealthier kids did, but I don't think that's true anymore. And I think one of the reasons it's not true anymore is it has actually in the United States become illegal to allow your kids out to play. So it's, it isn't officially illegal, but mm -hmm. what happens is it's become such a social norm to believe that kids are at great risk if they're outdoors without an adult watching them, that uh, that and and there are many uh, there are quite a number I shouldn't say many but quite a number of well published cases of parents who've been arrested for allowing their children as old as eleven years old. <laughs> to be out without an adult. Um, most cases are younger children than that, but children of the age that, you know, when I was a kid, nobody would think that that parent child, child shouldn't be able to go and play in the park or walk to school and so on and so forth uh, by himself or with peers. So, so, and if you are, if you are poor, and especially if you are a minority person and poor in the United States, you're more likely to be uh, arrested for this, more likely to have a threat of your child being taken away than if you're wealthier. If you're wealthier, you'll fight it and you'll win. But if you um, are poor and especially, you know, so they, the Child Protective Services investigates you because they found your child playing outdoors with no adult, and then they investigate you and then the signs of poverty are often interpreted as signs of neglect. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, that it's no longer the case that children whose families are less economically well off are better off in terms of play than, than other families are. Peter, what do you think? I mean, I, I think it seems obvious that the reason parents don't allow their children out to play is fear, right? Fear, maybe of physical safety, certainly, but then also this fear of like, they're not being prepared for a career. So they're, you know, they need to be in piano and violin and soccer and all this. So where, like, where is this coming from? You know, like, what do you, what have you seen change in the culture that has, has caused this to happen? Yeah, I, well, I think there's Why a lot are we of so willing to give it up? It was, so, you know, we all have such great memories of play. Like, why are we so willing to take that away? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think that there are, um, I'm sure there are really, you know, if we were, if we were to go into detail, we'd find multiple kinds of changes in the culture that contribute to this. But uh, to me, the most direct, the most direct causes are two. One is that um, there has just been an enormous increase in the pressure of schooling. And, um, and this has come uh, largely 
from um, from higher up. So it used to be when I was a kid, schools were run by truly run by the local school board. And we didn't have standardized testing. We didn't have mandates from top down about what had to be done. Basically, the way most schools operated is teachers could decide what they wanted to do in the classroom. So teachers were kind of the kings or queens of the classroom. Uh, now that meant that you were kind of, you know, if you had a mean teacher, well, tough, but if you had, but most teachers were pretty nice. I mean, most people going to teaching are not bad people. They go, most people who go into teaching are going to teaching because they like kids. And teachers understand kids and teachers would respond and teachers would, would, would orient their class in a way it's no fun to have a class of kids who are unhappy, right? So teachers would do things to help make kids happy. Now, I remember, for example, in fifth and sixth grade, I remember those grades very well. I don't remember so well the earlier grades, but we had a teacher who, uh, we had six hour school days, but our teacher had us outdoors playing two of those hours, even in the winter. So we'd half hour recess in the middle of the morning, half hour recess in the middle of the afternoon, a whole hour at lunch. I don't know if that was common for all schools. I know that there was a lot more recess and most schools had an hour for lunch and you could go anywhere you wanted. You could go off campus, you could play. The idea was you could go home and have lunch, but in these schools that I went to, hardly anybody went home for lunch because we wanted that whole hour to play. We would, we would you know, scarf down our lunch and then we would play. Uh, so, that, so, so that's one thing. And then, and we never had homework, unless once in a while the teacher would give us a poem, you know, ask us to write a poem or a story or something like that at home, something fun and creative. It wasn't graded, just something we did for fun. There was not this big emphasis on testing. There were no standardized tests. Um, and sometimes I remember, so we were, first of all, we were never in the, in the classroom more than an hour at a time. And even if we were, I remember this teacher would sometimes say, well, I can see you're all restless. Why don't you get up and play? And she had playthings right in the classroom. This was fifth and sixth grade, not kindergarten. <laughs> we had playthings in the classroom. Now there are kindergartens that don't have playthings in the classroom. So, so school was not the onerous thing that it was. Not that it was great, uh, but it wasn't so bad. And um, there was homework and by the time we got into secondary school, but it wasn't so much. And if you're reasonably bright, you could finish it during the study hour. And, and so basically when you were home, you were free to play. And so you, had, you really had more hours, far more hours of freedom to play than you had in school. So now school has over the years, not only has this, this, first of all, the school year has increased by five weeks from what it was when I was a kid. Really? Took away a whole month of summer vacation uh, and, and a month and a year, uh, I'm sorry, in a week during the year. So uh, I've actually looked up the data. The average school year was five weeks sh shorter uh, in the 1950s than it is today. So there's been a gradual increase in the school year. The school day in many schools is now seven hours. We've added this long bus ride. Nobody can walk to school anymore, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So kids are on the bus. They're spending an hour sometimes each way on the bus. So huge, I mean, they're spending more time. There's, in many cases, they're spending more time at school than their parents are at a 40 hour a week job. And that's especially true if you add homework. So homework, which was not pretty much non-existent then, is now occupying, depending on how, you know, how motivated the kids are and whether they feel like they've got to get into all these honors classes and get all the A's and so on. Homework can be anywhere from an hour to five or six hours a night. I mean, and, and so when you work it out, the kids are spending more time in school on average than their parents are at work when you count homework. You know, we decided in the United States um, towards the end of the of the 19th century that child labor should be outlawed. 
And uh, we have outlawed that kind of uh, hours for work, but instead we're now putting them in school for that number of hours in what really, if you think of it, is a terrible job. <laughs> no adult would accept a job like this. It's sedentary, it's micromanaged, it's you can't talk to your coworkers, you can't share ideas freely, you have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. Do you know any adults who would accept a job like that unless they were paid extremely high for it? <laughs> And yet this is, and yet we put our kids in this and we think that we're doing them if we think that it's for their good you know um this is uh, you know i don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is child abuse what we're doing to children today so that's one of the things that's happened and and some of this came about because of some of it came about because of changes in how schools are funded so when i was a kid schools were funded locally and mm -hmm. so the control was local now schools are funded by a combination of local and state and even federal money. So as soon as you've got money coming from the state and the federal government, then you've got control. They say, well, you get the money if you do this and this and this. And of course, the schools all want the money. Well, there was good reason for having money come from higher up because it helped to equalize um, different neighborhoods in terms of money they had. If you lived in a poor area, you had shoddy schools in the past because you didn't, you couldn't raise enough money in your area. So that was an argument for having state aid and then federal aid to education. But with that came state control and federal control and the people making the rules, people deciding what standardized tests everybody has to take, what curriculum people have to take. These are people who, have, who don't know children. <laughs> right. These are people who, unlike the teachers who had control when I was a kid, these are people who never see kids <laughs> right. at a certain line in the classroom. What they see is numbers. So they see test scores. And then, so the other thing that happened was the institution, was the institution of uh, international testing, PISA scores. Mm. So we began having, uh, we began hearing, oh, American school children are scoring so much lower on the international tests than the children in East Asian countries. <laughs> that was what we first hear. The Chinese kids are scoring so much higher than we are. This is we're going to fall behind the Chinese. We're always worried about this kind of thing, which is silly. But this is uh, what we what we began to worry about. And so, so a lot of politicians began to say very clearly, and, and even some educators. And these are educators who are theory educators who don't really know children. We, we began to say, well, we've got to do what the Chinese are doing, and the Japanese and the Koreans are doing. We've got to start. And they were already into very intensive schooling and a lot of testing and a lot of homework and tutoring after school and high suicide rates among the children. This was already happening there long before it began to happen here. And so that, and so we began to try to emulate that. And so that led to all this drill. It led to giving up a lot of the more creative things that were occurring in school and more and more drill for tests with the hope that we raise those PISA scores so, so we didn't look embarrassed compared to some of these other countries that were getting higher scores than we were. So that played a role. And then parents bought into this. So you be, they began to hear all this propaganda about how important it is that the children do well in school, how important it is that they do well in these tests. You began to hear more and more of the belief that the that you're never going to get a job if you don't go to college, and if you, and the only way you're going to get a co go to college is if you do very well in school on these tests. So the pressure began to mount on children, and uh, with the reason with and so I think that's what I think that's where the this increased schooling. And in addition to that, there's a kind of you know if you think of schooling, the whole bureaucracy of schooling. And the financial uh, the financial benefits to the people who are involved in it. Um, every kind of bureaucracy wants to increase itself, <laughs> and so schooling has these ways of increasing itself. You know, we we need more. We need in order to in order to get those test scores up, we need to spend more time in school and less time at recess and more drill and so on and so forth. And we need more specialist teachers because. One of the results of all this pressure is that is that we're we're a lot of kids are developing blocks about reading and arithmetic early on because they're being taught too early, and then we diagnose this as a learning disability. It's a it's created by the conditions. There's no 
doubt about that. But we create these blocks, we create learning disabilities, and then we hire specialists to deal with the kids who have learning disabilities. And of course, there's extra money from the state, the more kids you have in your school who have learning disabilities. So on top of that, there's the financial incentives from the drug companies. So we also, because we, because we don't allow kids to run around and play, there's a certain number of kids who simply can't adapt to sitting in their seats all this time and focusing on boring work. So we diagnose them as ADHD and we drug them a huge amount. So it, at one point it was 20% of boys at some point in the US were getting diagnosis of ADHD, something like 8% of girls. This is huge numbers. And of course the drug companies are making lots of money selling Ritalin and the other drugs that are being used to give to these kids. And um, so that's that, you know, so there's just a lot of financial incentive for doing not only doing what we're doing, but doing more of it. <laughs> and, you know, we got we instead of instead of developing the idea that schools are abnormal places for children because so many children aren't adapting to it, we decided that the children are abnormal and we have to change the children by giving them drugs to make them fit the school. So that's that's the school side of it. Then the other the other thing that played a role in why children aren't outdoors playing is the um, is the fact that we we developed a set of irrational fears about how dangerous it is outdoors. Those fears began, you know, they began to be developed even in the by the 1970s a little bit, but it really began in the, the the fears really were prodded on in the in the 19 late 1980s and into the 1990s there were a couple of famous cases of children who were snatched away on the street and, and murdered um you know this is a couple of cases out of millions and millions of children right yeah. <laughs> but of course this gets into the got into the popular press a huge deal was made out of it uh, laws were passed about it at the you began to have this campaign that our children need to be protected from this and um and you, there was a period of time when milk cartons in the united states had yes. pictures of missing children on them and the assumption of everybody eating their breakfast cereal, looking at the milk carton, well, these were children who were snatched away. You look at this picture, this sweet little girl, and she was, or this sweet girl or boy, and, and um, you assume this person was snatched away because their parents let the person go out and play. It turns out that somebody went back and did a study of those missing children, and almost all of them were runaways or they were kids who were, if they were snatched away, they were not snatched away by strangers on the street. It was by relatives, you know, by the ex-husband or the ex-wife or the, or some grandparent who felt that the child was being abused at home or something, you know, that, and so, it, and so the, this idea that your child is at great risk of being either either uh, attacked or molested or snatched away by some stranger got into the pulp into the into the into the mythology of the culture that this is uh, as if this is a very prevalent thing and so um, it, also at the, around this same time in the 1990s i remember hearing public service announcements on television and radio saying do you know where your child is right now as if you didn't know where your child is right now, you are a negligent parent. Um, and so no wonder parents began to <laughs> feel like I maybe am a negligent parent if I don't know where my child is. And so that, and so we began to be afraid of letting children out. And the result was that, um, is that children were, were either kept indoors or if they were to go out, it would be with, um, in, into some kind of an adult directed activity, some kind of adult directed sports or something rather than play. Or if you're wealthy enough, you, your nanny takes you to the park or something like that, or your parents do. And that's simply not a substitute. We think, of, you know, parents think of it as a substitute for play, but it's not. 
there's a lot of research that shows that that it simply doesn't stop. When children are playing on their own, they're making their own decisions about what to do. They're solving their own problems. They're learning how to make friends on their own. They're learning how to negotiate. They're learning how to, they're playing in risky ways that adults wouldn't allow them. And they're learning how to manage risk. They're developing courage. They're learning how to solve problems. They're learning, they're really learning that they can take control of their own life. But when they're in some kind of an adult directed activity, they're not learning that they can take control of their own life. So this is not a substitute for, none of this is a substitute for play. They're not even getting as much physical exercise. People yeah. at least think that when you're, if you're in a, on a adult directed team, some kid on adult directed team, you're getting more physical exercise. And if you're just out playing with your friends, but there's actually been some studies that show that you get less physical exercise there. You're spending a lot of time just sitting on the bench, waiting your turn, be, you know, listening yeah. to the coach and so on. When you're playing with a bunch of kids, you're, you're running around and doing things. So <laughs> you're much more active, more, um, and more involved if you're, um, if, if there's no adults around than if an adult is controlling things. So those two things, you know, one could go into further detail. There've been other social changes. We have fewer, we have smaller families. Mm -hmm. So there are fewer kids. We are less of a kid oriented society in a lot of ways, partly because there are fewer kids. We're more of an adult oriented society than we were in the past. We think about the, what's good for adults more than we think about what's good for kids. And we are also, um, we also are no longer a society of neighborhoods. So it used to be that, and this is, this is in some sense, the downside of a good thing that's happened. The good thing that's happened is women can get jobs, <laughs> but the bad side of that is nobody's home. So the result of that is that um, is that people don't know their neighbors as they did before. Women in the past were sort of the source of neighborhoods. And, um, and so if you knew your neighbors, and also even fathers were home more, even though they worked, they were home more than they are today and tended to be outdoors doing things. And so you would meet your neighbors and you would get to know the kids next door and your kids would get to know them. We were more of a neighborhood oriented society. Now we're a world where the, the adults that parents know are the adults that they work with, not the adults in the neighborhood. And the, and, and the kids are often bused to school. So they're not necessarily meeting the kids in their own neighborhood even. They're meeting the kids at school. Yeah. And so you don't, so you don't have a bunch of friends in the neighborhood that everybody knows and trusts and, and, and that also inhibits neighborhood play. So, okay, now we're all thoroughly depressed <laughs> because it's terrible for kids. I'm so sad that play is over. So I, let's, like, how can we capture that again? Like, I'm picturing, like, that I just want to, you know, cordon off a forest space and be like, everybody come bring your kids. I'll be over here eating a sandwich and just let them all go crazy. Like, I want to find ways to re- ignite the spirit of play in the world what like what can we do i don't think that we should lose this this amazing natural way that children should be any ideas there yeah so so they're kind of two different um two different ways to think about a solution so if you're thinking about the solution for your own family the solution for your own kids and if you have the option because it's possible for you you can take your kid out of school <laughs> and you can find a, a school like the Sudbury Valley School if there's one in your neighborhood, or you can do homeschooling using the method called unschooling. And more and more people are doing this. And so, and, and, and as more and more people are doing it, they're getting together and forming sort of pods and, and tri trips to the park and ways for the kids to get to know one another so that so that's one way for your own family. You've got plenty of free time. You've got opportunities as more and more people are doing it to connect with other families that are doing it. So that's, that's one kind of solution. That's an individual solution. And it's a solution that more and more families in the United States are taking. 
there's been a spike in homeschooling because of the coronavirus, and it's hard to know how many of them will go back. But there's been a gradual increase in homeschooling, and 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 within homeschoolers, an increase in the number who are doing so-called unschooling, where they're not giving a curriculum and test to the kids; they're allow, allowing the kids to pursue their own interests. So that's one kind of route, and I I uh, was one of the founding members of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, which is an organization that's working to make people more aware of that route and to help support people who want to move on that path and so on. So the other organization that I helped to found was the of organization called Let Grow that Lenore Skenazy, who you've talked to in the past, um, is president of. And uh, Let Grow is uh, working um, quite different from, from, whereas the Alliance is working to help people leave school, Let Grow is helping, trying to find ways to help children who are in school and help schools change and help whole communities change to bring more play and more freedom to children um, within the context of school and within the context of society as we know it. So um, there are some schools that have bought into this and um, I'm hoping that now that we're going, if we get past the pandemic, that we've had a sort of a lull in, in this. But prior to the pandemic, there were an increasing number of schools who were working with Let Grow to bring more play into the school, to reduce the amount of homework, to make school more playful and more fun, uh, to provide challenges for children that would be more interesting and, and more um, uh, get them out of the house. Uh, uh, and one of the things that we did in Let Grow, uh, which I feel was one of the most successful things we did, was to institute what the schools call Play Club, which is, uh, it's only an hour a week, but it's the beginning, an hour a week at school of free play where all the kids are free to play, all grades combined. These are in elementary schools, so kindergarten through fifth grade. Whole, in some schools, it's almost the whole school is open, outdoor playground, hallways, gymnasium, art room, play wherever you want with whomever you want. The teachers who monitor are instructed not to intervene unless there's a life threatened, <laughs> you know, that uh, unlike at recess where they tend to intervene all the time, they are they're instructed not to intervene. There are just basically two rules. You can't hurt somebody else and you can't break anything that's valuable. And so the children are playing in all kinds of fun and enjoyable and real ways. And there's lots of things for them to play with. And so um, a fair number of schools have institu instituted this uh, a couple of years before the pandemic. And um, it was going well. More schools were taking it up. We're hoping that there will be even more schools taking it up once we get back to regular, regular schooling and once schools feel safe enough to do that. That's not enough time for play, but it turns out that that hour of play actually kind of stimulates even further play. The kids get the idea of play. They make friends. They, they some of them, they say, well, let's get together after school. Let's, uh, you know, so that, and parents are getting the idea and teachers are getting the idea. Hey, this is a good thing. The kids are really look brilliant here in the play and they're managing themselves better than I ever imagined they would imagine they, they would. Uh, and and um, so this is something that's happened. Uh, another trend, it's not a big trend at this point, but um, in the United States, there has been some increase in the number of so-called adventure playgrounds. And what these are, uh, they used to be, they're also called junk playgrounds. They're, they're playgrounds that are, um, it's a lot of stuff that make, it kind of looks like a like an old fashioned dump. <laughs> they're old tires, they're old boards. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to play with. And uh, none of it matters if you break it, right? It's, uh, it's just junk. <laughs> and um, in, these, were, these were popularized in Europe, uh, I think beginning in the 1930s or 40s. And then they kind of died out for a while. Now they're coming back again and they're making a headway in the United States. And when they're properly done, they are fenced off, not to keep the kids in, but to keep adults out. So they're fenced off and the parents are not invited to go into the play area. In Europe, the parents, my understanding is most parents are fine, just leaving the kids go, get lots of parents be free, they can go home, they can go to a bar, whatever they want to do uh, while the kids are playing. Here, it's hard to get 
the parents away, but at least you can get them, you can say, I, I, one of them has a sign that says, your children know how to play, please leave them alone. <laughs> you know, And sometimes they're encouraged, if you want to stay, go sit over here and talk to the other parents. So that's happening. There, there are, it's still a small number of these in the United States, but it's a growing number. Uh, the other thing that's happening is some libraries are getting the idea that play, uh, they're getting the message that children are being deprived of play and some libraries are sponsoring free play. There's uh, one library that I've, um, that I visited and, and ha have had some, a lot of contact with decided that they were going to open up the library um, once a week for a whole, something like three or four hours after school and, and then in the summer even more often where there's play inside the library as well as outside the library. And there's a big sign that says joyful noise is welcome. And wow. if you are, if you want a, if you want a quiet library room, there's a quiet room, you can go to the quiet room and read, but it, the rest of the library is open for play as well inside as well as outdoors. This is, was, I, th I think they had to close it for the pandemic, but the, um, but it was extremely successful and other libraries were beginning to show some interest in it. So I think there are ways of solving this problem for our society today. And I think, I, I don't think that it's going to be solved by just going back to the 1950s, because I don't think that you're going to, talk many parents right now into just letting their kids go out and play. You're not going to talk to child protective services right away into allowing that to happen either. So by having these, what I've really described is opportunities where there's a lot of kids, a lot of opportunity to play, but there is an adult there, but the adult is trained not to intervene. That's the mm -hmm. way play club works. That's the way, um, that's, that's the way uh, adventure playgrounds work. There's a trained play worker there who, is, uh, who knows not to intervene, but who's there like a lifeguard on an on a ocean beach. If they're, and also there to make sure that there are no, so, the, so at, this person understands that risky play is a great thing, but the, they draw a distinction between risk and hazard. They want to yeah. remove hazards like rusty, upright nails that you might step on or a rotten branch in the tree that the kids climb in that might break if they climbed out on it, those kinds of things to make it possible to have risky play, but not to have on sort of hidden dangers there. So it's one thing if a child says, I can see that this is kind of a dangerous thing to do, but I'm choosing to do it versus I'm choosing to do this when they don't really know that there's danger there. That's an excellent distinction. Well, those that sounds like some the beginnings of some great solutions. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. And we, I did actually take my kids out of school and started an Acton Academy, which is a Montessori based, somewhat self directed learning environment. Um, and that's been amazing and inspired by Lenore the other day and your work with her, I'm sure we started, we decided that every Wednesday we go to this botanical garden park that has this enormous playground and it's just free play for an hour. And Great. it was so much fun. And so, yeah, we do, we like to incorporate a lot of play, which brings me to another question. Um, I'm sure you're very familiar with Maria Montessori's work. You know, Maria Montessori was not real big on play. Uh, we don't use that term really in Montessori. We use the term work. And um, what do you, like, what do you think about that in the, in the Montessori? I always want to like inject more play. And my partner, who's the director of Montessori is like, really, would you work here? Play is for another time. <laughs> so how do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, what I've read, I've read all of Montessori and I, but um, what I have read, I don't uh, particularly agree with. I, she was not um she was very much of an advocate of what uh, although she is you're right i mean she called it work but she was an advocate of what others would call constructive play blocks and building things and like that she was kind of opposed to fantasy play uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh but fantasy play is a huge part of children's play and it's extraordinarily important and it's how children develop their imagination it's how children develop critical 
develop hypothetical reasoning, you know, hy hypothesis developing is imagination and children in imagine children in imaginative play are developing the highest order of human thinking. And so to think that you wouldn't allow imaginative play for young children in a setting that's designed for their education is uh, silly in my view. So that, that's, uh, that's where I, I would disagree. I don't, I, I think that I think that the idea of using play with with the goal of a lesson in mind is a uh, distortion of play. Yeah. <laughs> the play is something that you do. Play has all kinds of wonderful learning consequences, but you're not doing it for that purpose. Right. Moreover, what any given child at any given time is going to learn from play depends on the child and what the child is doing. If you have the idea that you're going to set up play so that ch the children will learn a particular lesson, I don't call that play anymore. That is work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a playful, you can make it more playful and therefore it might be more fun for the kids than if it's not in a playful way. So I, I make a distinction between playful learning where the teacher has a goal in mind and the and the, and or you know some set of goals and the teacher is kind of setting up determining what the play things will be the Montessori blocks or whatever they are or the or the, and the teacher is um, is more or less directing the play in the sense of of basically telling the kids what they're to be playing at. Um, none of that is play, in my opinion, but um, it's it's more playful than if you take a more the typical school workbook approach <laughs> to the lesson. You're going to do this and drill this and so on and so forth. So I don't as long as we have schools that believe you have to teach some curriculum, that's fine to use a playful approach to teach the curriculum. But let's not confuse that with play. Sure, sure. So in one area we tend to touch on during a pandemic and at this time in life is is online play. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jane McGonigal's work. She wrote Reality is Broken. And her premise is like yours that we used to go, children used to be free to go out and have adventures and they it was spontaneous, it was uncontrolled, they didn't know what was going to happen, it was an adventure, and they would need to solve problems in the world as part of this play, right? And that now, because they're, they're now, everything that you've talked about, that they're more inside and they're also in organized play, that they still have the impulse, obviously, to do that, and so they're doing it now in gaming. And so, for I, mean, I think the greatest example is Minecraft. That they're going into Minecraft as a blank environment. They're creating what they want, and they're playing there. And they can actually network. Like these are my son's Minecrafting headphones. They can right. network with other children to to do this adventure. And my thinking, from what I've observed, is that they're doing a lot of the same things that we did when we were children playing outside, except for the physical movement of the body and that they are sedentary during this, which I think is ter you know, terrible. It's not good for them. But um, what, what, what do you think about online play? Is it something that we should be really concerned about? I know a lot of parents right now are feeling very guilty and upset because their kids are spending so much time online. Or is it something that you see as like an you know, tell, just tell us more. What do you think about that? Yeah, so um, so I, I, I agree with much of what you said. I've, I've actually, because parents so often asked me about this and others have asked me about this, I um, actually have spent a fair amount of time looking into the research on uh, online play, on um, video games, also on social media research. Um, and the research, despite what the cultural myths are about how terrible it is, the research is overwhelmingly shows positive effects of such play. Overwhelmingly. Um, the, um, the, um, but let me back up a little bit. First of all, you know, this, uh, this age, so when I talk about as a kid, uh, I was outdoors playing all the time and most kids were. There were also a lot of kids who weren't. Not because their parents kept them in, but because they wanted to stay in. <laughs> 
there were kids who I didn't understand them, but they just wanted to read. They were into reading, sedentary. Why would you sit indoors reading, getting fat, you know, all day long? They might be reading comic books. They might be reading other books. They might be reading. And there were also a lot of kids. We played a lot of it. We played a lot of games. We played all kinds of card games. We played board games. We played a lot of games. You know, gaming is not a new thing. It's new that it's online. And the online games are amazing, much more mentally stimulating than the games we used to play. So, um, so this is not like a sudden change from kids always being outdoors to now they're never outdoors. The other thing I can say is at a school like Sudbury Valley or other places, if, there, if there's a significant number of kids there, and if there is a nice outdoor area, you will always find kids outdoors, even though, even though they could be sitting on the computer all the time playing video games. Why is it that they're not always on the video games? They do play a lot of video games, and some of them really are playing video games all the time. But but it's about the same proportion as used to be reading and comic books all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain number of people, you know, call them nerds, right? Who that's who they are. And we've now had enough experience with that, both with those comic book readers and with gamers the games have been video games have been down long around for a long time now who've grown up that way and they're doing fine in the world <laughs> we don't have to worry about them okay. they be they're 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 in their heads more than they are in their bodies in uh -huh. some sense but they figure out they figure out at some point oh you know to be healthy i've got to exercise a certain amount and so they exercise a certain way they do it you know they become librarians or professors or things like that that involve the head more than the body and and i don't think we have to worry about them the but the majority of kids if there's an open menu if there's really kids outside to play with that's yeah. the key you know some people think that kids should just be attracted to the great outdoors for the sake of the outdoors that's an acquired taste <laughs> kids are not necessarily maybe some kids are but most kids are not necessarily attracted to the great outdoors what they are attracted to is other kids and other kids away from adults i can't overemphasize that if there are other kids to play with with no adults intervening kids will go out and play <laughs> most of them will not all of them and not all the time but but so I'll give you an example. This was quite some years ago. I, I cite this study in my book, Free to Learn, which was written, which was published in 2013. So this study was before 2013. But this was a study of kids, all of whom had computers because it was an online survey. And they asked these kids online right now, if you had a choice between going out and playing in the park with your friends, with no adults intervening, versus playing your favorite video game, which would you choose? And 80, uh, 80 something percent said, I would prefer to go and play in the park with my friends, but that's not possible. So what we've done is we've prevented kids from going outdoors without adult supervision. The only way that many kids can play uh, in, on their own in the way they want to play with other kids without adults telling them what to do is online with and 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 so this is this is the way that children have have preserved play despite what we adults are doing to them <laughs> if yeah. we take that away from them then we oh. really have deprived them of play and yeah. some parents are taking that away from them so no, no surprise, what the research shows is those kids who are playing video games are doing much better on all measures than kids who are not playing video games. Uh, so playing video games, aside from the physical benefits, as you pointed out, has all the other kinds of benefits of play. And so there have been studies that show, there, for example, there was a study done um, by a number of universities, including Columbia University School of Mental Health and some European universities all collaborated in this study. Study of 6,000 kids between the age of six and 12, or six to 11, I forget which, something like that. And um, what they did is they, uh, by, by interviewing the parents, they determined how many hours a day each of these kids was playing video games. And by interviewing the teachers independently of that, with the teachers not knowing about hours playing video games, they asked the teachers questions about the child's 
social skills the child's how many friends the child has how many the child's emotional stability well-being and how bright the child was and how the child was doing in school every one of those measures the kids who were playing five hours or more a week of video games were doing better than the kids who were playing less than five hours a week wow so um and and there's a lot of other evidence showing that um that that video game play is real play <laughs> and it is probably the most mentally challenging play that has ever been developed in, in, in so many ways there are other games that are mentally challenging like chess but it's only mentally challenging in one kind of limited way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whereas video games there's no end to the kinds of mental challenges that are possible and and there's so much creativity in many of these games there's social interaction in these games these games, I know kids who I know unschooling kids who are learning foreign languages by playing video games in a foreign language. Yeah. Not so much because they want to learn the foreign language for its own sake, but they want to play this game with these kids who speak this foreign language or they want to learn this game, this amazing game that hasn't been trans, you know, that's in Japanese. And yeah. so the um, so that's happening. There are kids I've heard from parents who tell me that they, you know, they learn from their by talking with their kids, they've learned that some of these games involve math that you would never expect a kid of the age who's playing this game to be able to do this math like somebody was telling me about a game where the in order to um, achieve your goal you have to um, you have to be able to calculate the compound interests on your investments and <laughs> you have to be able to translate between different monetary systems um, and so these are and these are kids you know unschooled kids who've never been never taken a math class but they figure out how to do this <laughs> you know this is uh, something that a lot of parents have to hire an accountant to do for them so the, <laughs> <laughs> you know the um, so that there's a lot of learning that goes on in these games as as well as social skills i sometimes hear from parents and this is another thing about play I sometimes hear from parents well i see my child getting angry while playing and that can't be good for him and so i want to stop him from taking playing because he gets angry during this game and you know one of the what, you know, if you if you watch kids playing outdoors, they get angry too. Sometimes they get ang kids do get angry. And one of the one of the purposes of play, which is called the motion regulation theory of play, is that it provides the opportunity for children to experience negative emotions and learn how to deal with them. That's one of the in, in a low stakes environment, right? And in, in a low stakes environment. So if your kid is getting angry uh, or your kid is getting frightened as a result of some of this play, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We we are a world as, as well as protecting children from the phys from physical damage by keeping them indoors we're constantly worried about psychological damage if they're feeling angry they're feeling fear but we're not protecting them from psychological damage by doing that we are making yeah. them vulnerable by doing that they have to experience anger in this kind of low stakes environment and fear and learning how to deal with it yeah definitely i love your message of resilience that's a big thing for us at acton and and me personally too is like Going through all that hardship is what helps you grow the strength so that you can handle right. more, more challenge as you get older, like growing your muscles of all that and on, on the way to greater challenge. And um, a lot of people are afraid to watch their kids struggle. And it's hard, right. right? But you have to let them struggle because that's how they're growing. Like Lenore talked about that old film strip that we would watch where they the chicken is like coming out of the egg. And if you take the shell off of the chick, the little chick that's exiting yeah. the egg, it will it die the, because okay. it's not right. building what it needs, right. the strength in its neck in order to like stand right. up and survive after. Right. That's always left an impression. So on you're, me. you're right, it's hard to watch and that's why we shouldn't watch. That's why right. we should just let kids go to the bar, like you us. said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go do something. Yeah. Go play with your own friends, mom. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. exactly. You know this idea also that parents are supposed to be involved in children's play. You know, playing with children, or this is a this is a sort of a uniquely Western idea. That um, David Lancy, who's an anthropologist who's studied children throughout the world, says. You ask, you go to any kind of traditional culture and you say, 
ask, to ask them about playing with children, they'll say, well, why should I play with children? Children have so many other children to play. I, I've got adult things to do. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Children, in t typically, you know, we used to talk about, even in America, we used to talk about the culture of childhood. There were a lot of research on what's called the culture of childhood. And this idea that children have their own world that's away from adults and it kind of is parallel to the adult world and it's in the child's world that the child in their interactions with other children in the rules they develop the ways they learn to manage themselves the, the traditions they develop this is how children to learn to live in a culture of peers and as they become adults those skills that they developed in the culture of peers become the skills that allow them to live in the culture of adulthood okay. and the the two cultures are not completely independent of one another the adult the children's culture tends in some ways to mimic the adult culture and draws from the adult culture but it's independent in the sense that there's no adult there telling the kids what to do and there and it used to be and this was you know i, I think i at the beginning i talked about as i moved from town to town as a child I would enter into a new culture of childhood and I had to figure out what is it that the children do here? How do I get accepted by the children here? How do I, how do I become one of, you know, what is it that I have to learn to become one of the, one of the, one of the part of the community of children in this town or neighborhood that I've just moved into? That was part of children's lives and that's, and children throughout the world live in that, have always lived in that kind of way until recent times. Yes, definitely. Well, you are, I am right in line with everything that you're saying. And I think our audience has learned so much about the value of play and the joy of play and some key actionable ideas of how we can bring our, bring that magic of play back into our children's world. And more than anything, probably really helped people, myself included, feel um, less anxiety about the online play. So thank right. you so very much. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And um, we will let we, I know that um, we're going to put all the links to everything and where people can find you at the bottom of the episode. But if people want to go right now and get your book or learn more about you, what is a great place for them to go right now online? Well, they can find my book just, you know, they could get it from Amazon or they could just Google the book free to learn. Um, the, uh, I read a blog for psychology today called freedom to learn. And uh, there are by now about 200 posts there that deal nice. with these kinds of issues. Um, I, I uh, maintain a Facebook uh, profile. Um, that you could follow me on Facebook. I uh, regularly po repost uh, some of my blog posts there. And there's a lot of discussion of the blog post that occurs on that page. So that's another place. And I also would encourage people to look at the websites for um, Let Grow, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're involved with schools. Uh, but also there's a lot of, uh, a lot of materials for parents um, and ideas uh, that would um, help you uh, give more freedom to your children. And um, and I might encourage people also to look at the website for the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, where there's a lot of um, resources for people who are either doing self, you know, promoting self-directed education, facilitating self-directed education for their own children or are thinking about it. Great. Thank you so much for those resources, Dr. Gray. It was so great having you today. And thank you so much to the audience for stopping by. Okay, thank you. Thanks for listening to the New Schools Podcast. Tell a friend. Previous episodes and show notes, including any books or websites our guests recommend, can be found at thenewschools.com. If you're a parent who is looking for a new school for your family, send us a message. We would love to help. We can answer questions, share the resources we have, and help you get in touch with people in your area who are on the same path, determined to provide their kids with the best education. It's wildly important work. Thank you for doing it. And we'll see you next time.